and welcome. His fusion of jazz, blues and rock guitar set a standard envied by many of his peers. And his love for the spiritual depth of the East added an extra dimension to his sound. This week on 101, meet the legendary British-born guitarist, John McLaughlin. His early influence and training came from classical music, but he soon discovered the rich depth of sound from across the Atlantic in the form of blues and jazz. As a young man, John McLaughlin also found himself caught in the wave of Indian spiritualism that many other musicians explored in the 1960s. By the age of 27, the talented guitarist left Britain to perform with leading figures in New York's jazz scene, many of whom had played a big part in shaping his interest in music. The influence of India never left McLaughlin, and before long, he was performing with musicians from the subcontinent in collaborations such as Shakti and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. He's been hailed as one of the 100 greatest guitarists of all time by Rolling Stone magazine, and his peers have credited him with evolving the sound of the guitar over the years. Even as he's matured, John McLaughlin's relationship with Asian fusions remains strong, and his own life is lived in a far more holistic manner. John, I'm delighted to have some time with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very honored and flattered to be invited. Well, your music is known for evolving. You've been a person who's evolved your musical style through the years, from, from the 60s right through to, to now. And I wonder where your music has ended up nowadays, at what stage it, it's evolved to, and, and how, what it represents nowadays. What does it represent? Um, I would say it's... it's, it's, um, it's my way of life, isn't it? Um, I'm very much involved in the, the interior s part of life, um, but music itself is really, it's a kind of form, and so it's a way for me to, uh, what do we say in music? Uh, it's it really, it's very strange, know. because you can only really speak about your life. I, I, the only thing I can really speak about is how I feel about music first, how I feel about myself, how I feel about the people around me, and, uh, and, and globally speaking. Of course, this is all affected by uh, uh, my experiences in life. So I guess it's, it's kind of a we In improvisation, it's kind of a life story. I think that's the only thing we can speak about. What, what influences you musically nowadays? I know, I know your early influences. We'll talk about those in a moment. But in terms of your, what, well, as they say on the cliche, you know, in the cliche phrase, what's on your iPod or what's on your MP3 player? What's on my, oh, a lot. Um, my heroes, uh, which are quite numerous musical heroes, uh, Miles Davis, of course, Coltrane, Bill Evans, but uh, I would add in some classical composers. Uh, I, of course, Bach and Mozart. I, grew, I started music as a, as a pianist, classical. Classical, not really. I mean, I stopped when I was 11. But um, any, any I, real modern stuff? I mean, any, re anything really that's, that's the chart stuff nowadays? Do you, does that interest you at all? Really, really, sorry. But I have, of course, I have people like uh, um, singer K.V. Narayana Swami or uh, Vilay Pati Subramaniam or you, you know some of the great great masters of uh, of uh, Indian uh, whether South Indian whether North Indian uh, I'm very fond of Kawali too I have to say uh, of course it all began in Doncaster South Yorkshire in England uh, slap yeah. bang in the middle of World War II there was no Kawali around then of course no 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 <laughs> um, Back then, you know, you, obviously you were going through a very traumatic childhood. It was post-war as you were a toddler. And you were no, it was in the middle of the war. You were middle when you were born, yeah, 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 as you were growing up, though. I, mean, I wonder how much of that really was, you know, how many of those, how strong the memories were from that time? Of the war, really, almost nothing, Riz, really. And we were living in a little village. Uh, that was really the reason why my parents moved, because they were in South London, where the, the bombers would drop their bombs if they missed their target. And so there were some, uh, they were very afraid when houses started to go up. And so they moved up north, and it was a really a, a very small village, about maybe 200 people. So we really didn't see. I remember hearing sirens when I was a kid, but I never saw like the searchlights and the bombers and the planes coming over there, no. You were only five when you had that first vivid musical experience, and it involved Beethoven. Tell me about that. Yeah, how do you know all this? You, you know, <laughs> learn, you know a lot learn. about me already. Uh, it's true, my mother was an amateur violinist, so 
she was fantastic to me, Riz. She really helped me in so many different ways. Uh, but of course, this was um, my first uh, musical experience, an experience. And when you're five years old, um, I didn't really know what was happening to me. You know, when your hair starts to stand on end, uh, yeah, you said you got goosebumps. I really did. I, and I, I, when you're five, you don't really know what it means. But I knew it was coming from the music. And I, I, have, a, I have a personal theory that that really marked me out from, from my life to come. Well, it was interesting because um, you were the youngest of five children. I gather your, your siblings were quite strong Francophiles. They were learning yes. a lot of French. And, and they had quite a strong influence, influencing you apart from They certainly did, yeah. particularly uh, my eldest brother. Um, because we grew up in, in really what you would call an agnostic family. Uh, I never went to church, and, um, but we used to discuss things, and he was a great discusser, and we used to talk about things, you know, God and religion and what does it all mean and these great questions of life and death, but not that I really understood anything at that time because I was young, but um, it really it stimulated me, and uh, I think that also marked me for future years. You were fascinated by all the French people coming to... I was, I was. I mean, and they, uh, I mean, from three years old, uh, you know, I'd be going one, two, three, now in French, and that's uh, why God sang, he said, you know, and, uh, you know, and then the French people coming to the house, and then when I was about 13 or 14, they would take me to see the film noir, that's right. the French that's film noir, of which I'm still a fan, mm -hmm. Riz. It's, I mean, great, uh, French cinema of the 50s and um, and of course uh, because I had to see it hear it in French and uh, the subtitles but this was all part of inculcating this francophilia which they were very successful at in fact because I remember when I went to France the first time in 19 I said I'm home I feel very <laughs> good here actually I feel better here than the UK <laughs> with your cravat and cigar <laughs> <laughs> your parents separated when you were seven now you don't have many strong memories of your father do you I do I still do yes uh, yeah God bless him um, but he was not really helpful uh, in, in in, in my education, really, in any way. Was your mother, uh, was your mother Mary, that, that actually um, encouraged your music, though? You were saying she was a violinist, but she got you onto piano at the age of eight. Yes. Well, I actually ha I had to ask for piano lessons. And, uh, <clears throat> but I think it was, it was because of her and because of maybe the genes came in. Uh, I loved to, 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 to hear her play violin, which she, which she didn't do very often because with five kids cooking and everything. Um, but uh, at eight, I, I said to my mom, I said, can I, can I have piano lessons, you know? It'll cost half a crown a lesson, you know, which was quite a lot of money. Remember <laughs> half, yeah, a crown? half a crown? Yeah. And uh, so, yes, I can do that, Johnny. And so we did it. I did it for three years until 11. And, and, and I had this music teacher who was so terrible. I mean, old <laughs> school. You know, and I'll be going do 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 with the ruler <laughs> on the fingers. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's enough yeah. to make you give up. But anyway, at, at eleven, the guitar came into the house, and that changed my life forever. And the guitar was a hand-me-down from from your brothers, Absolutely. wasn't it? And yes, um, but, it was. but they, you took to it so much to the extent that your mother once had to stop you playing because your fingers were bleeding. Apparently so. <laughs> I don't remember that. This is a very very dramatic story, isn't it? <laughs> but I don't remember that. But she told me quite categorically that uh, Johnny, you have to stop now. <laughs> so I did. At what point did jazz come into your life, though? After all this classical training and interest, uh, mm. that's what really shaped you in your early years. And I wonder what, uh, in your sort of teen years. Well, I was, I think I was very fortunate, Riz, because, of, uh, as I just mentioned, the guitar arrived, and I fell in love with this instrument right away. It was just an, one of these $5 things, very cheap, but it didn't matter. I just, I was in love with this instrument. And very shortly, because of my older brothers in, in university, by, uh, this would be 53, the blues movement just began in the UK. And since they were going to, especially the eldest, who was going to university by this time, he was bringing these blues records. Um, <clears throat> and that, and there were of course the guitar players, Big Will Brunzi, Led Belly, uh, 
Muddy Waters and you know the, the great Mississippi Delta blues players. And this was a this was a revolution for me because all I I mean one, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden I started, mm, I woke up this morning, <laughs> you know, I mean wow, what is this music? It's fantastic music and the guitar playing. So uh, that that was really a revelation. And then it was just shortly after that, because of this francophilia that it was in the family, in came a record of Django Reinhardt from the Hot Club de, de, de Paris with Stefan Grappelli. Actually, it was with clarinetist Hubert Rostang. But in any event, I heard this guitar player and who completely blew my mind. And then I found out he, he'd been in a caravan accident and he'd lost the use of these two fingers. So just to twist the knife, he was playing everything with two <laughs> fingers. I mean, even today I, I hear him play, I'm, I'm just in awe. And, and this, I think, was really the, the first step in jazz music because I heard improvisation. I heard it in, in the blues, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, there's a looseness in blues and a wonderful kind of fluidity. But that actually transposed itself into jazz, and Django Reinhardt really, he put, he put, the, uh, he put that jazz cap on my head, I think. Well, it was a wonderful career path it set you on. I'm going to ask you more about that in just a moment. We'll take a short break here. More with John McLaughlin when we return. Welcome back. You're watching One on One. We're speaking with British-born jazz fusion musician John McLaughlin. There was a major turning point in your life when you were 24, and you discovered the writings and the teachings of uh, an Indian saint, uh, Ramana Maharishi. And you also were influenced at that time by uh, philosopher Douglas Harding, too. And, and these things yes. had an influence on you, didn't they? Very much so. Uh, um, indeed. Uh, the, I would say the first influence came from Ramana Maharshi. Uh, because by this time, this, this would be in the early 60s, um, and uh, there was a very eventful decade for me um, because already uh, trying to answer these, the big questions of life, life and death, existence, what are we doing here, who are we, what's this marvelous planet we live on in this fabulous, mysterious universe, uh, and, and try to fathom these questions. And I'd grown up, don't forget, as an agnostic, you know, like God is just a word, and there's nothing, and there's no reality behind it. So it was, it was interesting for me when I finally, I became a member of the Theosophical Society in London, and, and it was only there where I found actually very nice books, because otherwise it was mainly blue-haired ladies drinking tea. <laughs> very charming, but uh, not really inspiring <laughs> not spiritually, models, yeah. if you know what I mean. Right. But the library was great. And there I found books from Ramana Maharshi. And, this, and I saw a photograph of him on the opening page, and this is the first holy man I'd seen. And, and he has such a marvelous face and marvelous eyes, and, and it, that affected me. And so I started to read about him and try to figure out, and of course he, you know, he has his particular way. Douglas Harding was in a way the Western analog to Ramana Maharshi, uh, a marvelous Western philosopher um, who's not really well known, which is regrettable because I think he made a fantastic contribution to Western philosophical and spiritual thought. He certainly did to me. And uh, th because I'm a Westerner, and there are some fantastic Western people. Of course, in the 60s, we were all going east mm -hmm. because the answers to existence uh, we all felt uh, lay with India. I mean, let's face it, India and China, too, for that matter, they've been addressing these fundamental questions for thousands of years. If you go back to the Upanishads, the and uh, the, the, the Confucius and Lao Tzu and these people, I mean, fantastic people who have been finding solutions to these questions, really. This, uh, I guess, was, was what set you on the path to your influences of, of Indian music and, and the people you started to meet. There's Zakir like Hussain, people like this as well. Absolutely, yeah. because there's one thing, once you start re reading about the philosophy, uh, at some point, you realize that it's all inclusive. It's, it's not exclusive. And that brought me into the music. And the music itself of Asia in general, but in India in particular, is inclusive of all the aspects of the human dimension. 
whether from the most capricious to the most profound and, and meaningful. And this was marvelous. And I think it was because of this that Coltrane had such an impact on me when, when La Love Supreme came out in 1965, because with one single record, he integrated the spiritual dimension, a spiritual awareness, say, into jazz music. And prior to this, this, this it, it never existed. It was in the masses of, of Mozart or Verdi, the Requiems, this kind of religious overtone. But for the first time, you, you actually got the name Mahavishnu while you were on your travels as well, and it became the name of your band, didn't it? The Mahavishnu Orchestra, yes, of course, yes. the, the legendary group. So I wonder where that name came from. Well, I arrived around, uh, must be January, the January 69 in New York, uh, and still full of, full of beans to, to find, you know, and I would go to this guru, I would go to the, I would go to the Sufi meetings, Pirvalat Khan, and I used to meet musicians there too, this was very nice. And this yogini and this yogi, and I was doing this Vishnu Devananda yoga, and uh, you, know, um, you know, I was really gung ho. I was doing three hours of yoga a day, 90 minutes in the morning, 90 minutes in the evening. This is, I was very healthy. I still am, but that was the, in those days. It was that was a lot. And then finally, I I, I began studying meditation with Sri Chinmoy, mm -hmm. who passed away uh, just a few years back. But um, and I stayed with him for five years. But I have to say, uh, even after two years, I didn't know what meditation was. <laughs> meditating hours a day, and but uh, it's it's a question of of uh, of seeing. That's all. And, but it takes time. It takes perseverance. But while I was with Sri Chinmoy, he, uh, he decided to give me this spiritual name. This is my spiritual name. And so when Miles Davis, who was really behind the Mahavishnu Orchestra, not my guru, although Miles was a guru to me. Yeah, and, he's the one who told you to form your own band. Exactly. When he, it must have been in, in around October 1970. He said, out of the blue, it's time before you're on band. I gather you're in Boston at a gig together. And that's yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and, and he was such an honest man, really honest. And I took him at his word, and I said, I have to justify him, even if I don't justify myself. Because Miles, he, he knew how much I revered him. I mean, I've been revering him since I was 16 years old. You did one of your first major gigs, I think your first major gig, uh, opposite John Lee Hooker on yes. Baker Street, uh, the Whiskey A Go-Go, 1971. What went through your mind after that? That was a real good gig for you guys, wasn't it? It was. No, but I, I, I knew, I knew this band, I knew this band was great. I, I, I knew it was my time. I don't know how, because I remember when, when my manager, I'd, I'd been signed with this little record company, um, and my manager said, so let's, let's go and see Clive Davis at, at CBS. CBS at the time, and uh, and Clive Davis, who was one of the greatest record men I, I'd ever met, uh, he only knew me because I'd recorded in a silent way with Miles. I was just another young kid on the block, you know, coming from Europe. But um, by this time, a couple of years had gone by, and uh, Miles had given me the word, form your band. So I did, and I had this Mahavishnu Orchestra, and my manager took me to see Clive Davis, and he said, well, what kind of music are you doing? I said, you know, Clive, it's very difficult for me to put a, put a name on it, but I know it's going to be great. He said, you know, I like the way you talk. <laughs> Let's sign. That's great. And that was now. it. No, what a wonderful, uh, that was the 70s, you know. This great, there was, there was in those days, I don't see much of it today. I, I think it's a very harsh world. But in those days, there was a great deal of hope and a great deal of, potential everywhere and uh, this was it was very you could feel it what do you feel apart from like that that uh, instance what have been your real defining moments in your life well that Ma when when I got invited to America to play with Tony Williams and when I got to play with Miles this really was um, was just marvelous for me and when Miles said go do it and and I did it just for him because I had to do it for him to prove that he was right, you know. And, and, we, and we had, 
amazing success. It was, it was extraordinary. You did have one moment, I think when you were about 32, you went through what, what you described as existential angst and you ran off to the, the French Alps for a, for a week to a monastery. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's, I did. And I went into a monastery for, for, not for a long time, about 10 days. And it was marvelous to, to, to be in a, because when you're in one of these kind of uh, they call cult in, in, in France, you know, with the guru and the disciples. And it's very close-knit, and the, it's a little exclusive. And I, I don't, I'm not a fan of exclusivity. There was a guy, there was a monk who hadn't spoken for 60 years, his vows. Yes, silence. yes. I, and I was speaking to him, of course. He wasn't speaking to me, but he had the most <laughs> fantastic eyes. Mm. Really. Can you imagine somebody who hasn't spoken for 60 years? I mean, he must have been about... 78, 79, so he was not even 20, and he'd given this vow of silence. And so he had these eyes that spoke volumes, because, of course, everything came out from that, you know? Uh, and just, and, just, and they were Trappist monks, as far as I can remember, and just following the discipline, being up at four in the morning and being with them. Um, this really uh, was probably the initiative that, that made me leave that particular uh, Sri Chinmoy cult. You, uh, you've had an, a remarkable career, and it's sustained. Uh, you know, you've been one of the few who's who can say I've, I've lasted and stayed up there. But what uh, is there anything left outstanding for you to do? Do it better, really. <laughs> yes, uh, do it better. Uh, I mean, every day is a new day. I know. I thank God for, for for another day. I mean, I'm at that age now, you know. Um, because you get to a certain point when you're over 60, it's like, hey, I'm on borrowed time. You, you look good on 60 anyway. plus. Let's read that. Yes. Oh, what, yeah. about, what about uh, legacy then? Well, how would you like to be remembered? What would you like your legacy to be? Oh, uh, a guitar player. A good guitar, it's player. guitar player. No, because, <laughs> you know, and because people speak about, and even to uh, myself over the years, about the spiritual aspect of music. And it's all, it's all so much blah, blah in the end, because everybody's spiritual. For all spiritual beings, you know, and those, and there are many, many, many in the East, in the West who are aware of it, and God bless them all. But we're all spiritual beings. Nobody's more spiritual than anyone else. It's just whether they're aware of it to some degree or not. That's all. And I'm just a guitar player, and the music is the message. There's no, there's no other message. <laughs> well, John McLaughlin, I wish you a lot of luck with that. Thank you so Thank much. You, it was a real Chris. pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.